Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resimczynski and I, Niels Kastrelassen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. Mark, great to have you back this week. I know it's a very early start for you today and it's even Easter Friday, so I really, really appreciate you taking time out um, to do this. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. This is, is it... Uh it's been a, a good first quarter for a lot of uh, a lot of managers, so that's uh, that's been ex uh, exciting. And uh, this will be good to take a little bit of time off for the weekend and then sort of regroup for the second quarter. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, we do have a long list of topics, actually, all provided by you, I have to say. So, again, I really do appreciate that. But, of course, first, I'm always curious to know what's kind of been on your radar besides the topics we're going to talk about um, since we last spoke a few weeks ago. You know, obviously, we could talk about a lot of events going on in the marketplace. But the thing that really sort of cap captured me and ca caused me a little bit of pause was the fact that uh, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, died this week. And so uh, for those who don't remember, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics for all of his work on uh, behavioral psychology. So, so, so he really isn't an economist, but he won it in economics for all of what he did that was associated with behavioral economics. Now, it's interesting you say like, well, we're having a podcast, we talk about managed futures, we talk about systematic investing, we talk about quant investing. So why am I bringing up Daniel Kahneman? And when you think about it is, is that because he sort of highlighted all of the issues with our behavioral biases, the mistakes we made, then it sort of sets the foundation for why you wanna be a disciplined investor. So by using rules, we can offset the behavioral biases that we have. So uh, I will sort of say that if you look at the body of research that he's done over his career, it's extremely innovative, extremely creative, and it really sort of changed so many people's thinking. Uh, and in some sense, there was this whole school of thought that, well, let's just worry. Uh, we want to be mathematical economists. We want to sort of focus in on, on, the, on the math. And so he brought it back to sort of say, let's talk about the people that economics is still a social science, finance and investing is still a social activity, and the behavior of how people act still matters in what drives prices and what drives investments. So I think that uh, if you haven't taken a look at the work of Daniel Kahneman, take a look at it if you have a little extra time. There's a lot of good reviews. He's written some great books, but I think he'll be uh, very much missed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, I, I didn't expect that, actually, but I did notice it, uh, I think, yesterday. Um, and uh, yeah, he's definitely put down a, a tremendous amount of foundational work that our industry in particular have been able to uh, use um, and kind of build the narrative um, for, uh, for why it uh, makes sense to look at what we do. So with that, a super important point, there's one thing that I uh, noticed uh, as well, nothing to do uh, uh, and nothing as important as what you just mentioned, but it was a report that came out uh, from With Intelligence. And the headline I caught, and I know you also uh, read it and you have some other observations perhaps, but what I, there's two things that I, from memory, uh, I don't have re the report in front of me, but from memory, there are two things that stood out. One is I think they kind of got just highlight and confirm that CTAs, managed futures, actually uh, had their fifth 
consecutive positive year in a, you know uh, last year even though it wasn't a big positive year and the other thing is that CTAs and managed futures had the lightest outflow among all primary hedge fund strategies in 2023 despite actually it not being a great year for the strategy so those are kind of interesting observations on an individual basis one is that i think it's often overlooked um, how well the strategy have done. People still talk about the last decade instead of looking at, you know, the great five years we've just had. And and also the fact that, uh, and this was brought up in a recording I did with Alan this week uh, that we are bringing out uh, with certainly one of the industry leaders uh, from the CTA space in a couple of weeks. And it's this thing about whether things are really changing a little bit um, and and whether the, the strategy, Managed Future CTAs, whether we're actually moving back towards how it was seen back in the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, where we weren't trying to confine it to make money just when there is a crisis because institutions really wanted it to be a crisis alpha strategy and so on and so forth. Back then, it was a much more kind of freely accepted okay to be volatile type strategy. Um, but of course, with zero interest rates, uh, suddenly people weren't looking for 15% returns. If they could get four or five, that was fine. Things are changing now. And I think you have some thoughts on this as well. Well, I think that the zero interest rate comment is, is probably the most important. When you think about all the flows in alternative investments in a lot of other hedge fund strategies, generally, let's take a look long, short, market neutral. Part of it, uh, the whole strategies with a lot of the hedge funds to say, let's get very low volatility. We won't promise you strong returns, but we'll give you high risk adjusted returns. And so if you have, uh, if your alternative is cash and that's at zero, well, then if somebody says, oh, I'm going to give you a 4%, 5% at, uh, at uh, two, three vol, it's actually not a bad investment if you look at where overall interest rates were extremely low. So if you could say like, well, I'm beating bonds, it makes a lot of sense. So now what happens is that we're looking at, uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, o- over five and a quarter on nominal rates, we got uh, positive real rates. So all of a sudden there is a heck of a lot of investments that if you said, oh, I'm going to give you five and a half percent or six percent net of fees is my hedge fund return there's a lot of people who say like well that's not really that impressive i'm not real i could actually put my money in cash and do better so in and that you start saying is that well let's look at some other alternative investments that might be able to give me a higher potential upside and then it's when you think that managed futures and trend following becomes much more attractive and the other thing that I think that's going on is, is, is that uh, uh, everyone sort of viewed this as that, let's look at uh, alternative investments and let's think of that in terms of like, okay, that'll give me some downside protection. But if the downside protection is just uh, flat returns relative to cash, it's not as attractive. I want to have something that has positive convexity. And that's the underlying reason for why you get crisis alpha, the underlying reason for why managed futures and trend following is so attractive is because you're getting that positive convexity. And convexity is what people want. The question is, is that can I get it cheap? And the easiest way to get it cheap is sometimes is manage managed futures. And managed futures has also benefited from the fact this is that, well, since we know that the margin equity ratio is you know, maybe around 15, 20%. So you're holding a lot of cash. All of a sudden, this is said for your managed futures, if you can hold a f- uh, for most of your, you know, margin money and your excess cash in T-bills, you're getting five and a uh, quarter right off the top. So so you're doing a, a pretty well right from the beginning where before in the, you know, a decade ago, managed futures had zero as their T-bill rate. So you're, you started out the year flat. Now that you're starting out with a positive return because of, you know, cash, which is also another positive. And I think that, uh, the third thing that's going on, which is bad for the managers themselves is a lot of trend following strategies are now put in swap form. And so the, so, which is relatively easy to do. 
So there's a lot of institutional investors who sort of say that I can put a total return swap, alt risk premium swap with an underlying trend index and use that as another way to provide positive convexity, which is a, a, an explosive market in terms of a lot of growth that we not we don't sort of see in the numbers from asset managers. Yeah, no, very interesting. Well, let's stick with trend following for a little bit because, of course, we are recording on the last official trading day. Um, but for most countries, that was actually yesterday. Uh, but I do think there's a few Asian markets that are still open today on Friday. I don't think the mar- numbers are going to change a lot uh, today, though. Um, but it was another pretty solid month from my, what I can tell and the early numbers for CTAs and trend followers in, in particular. And um, many of the benchmarks that we follow from uh, Societe Generale, uh, like the SOCGEN Trend Index, um, looks like it's going to finish March and therefore Q1 of 2024 at a new all-time high, just like we're going to see many of the established managers making new all-time highs uh, in their individual program. And what's very pleasing, of course, to see is that this is not driven by any kind of crisis, uh, except, of course, if you are a chocolate maker uh, and you didn't hedge your cocoa, um, because that's have a massive surge again in price uh, in the last 30 days, in the last month. I think it's up like 60% in March, and it's up something like 240% uh, in the last year. It incidentally... It's actually Q1 is also the best start to a year uh, for the S&P 500 since 2019. So, uh, and bonds, uh, as we will learn in a few seconds, um, have been flat, um, so to speak. So not a bad time all around for investors um, and a great time for investors uh, in trend following. If we break it down a little bit further, I do think the best opportunities uh, were found in equity uh, markets and in energy uh, markets for trend followers. Of course, still with a few standout markets like cocoa and also perhaps Mexican peso uh, continuing to offer some opportunities. And now it wasn't a, as e- explosive and exceptional uh, in terms of the performance uh, as we saw in February. And I think a little, a little bit of give back um, probably came from the grain sector during the March, uh, where prices recovered a little bit from their longer term um, bear market. Fixed income, pretty flat, uninspiring, frankly. Uh, metals, um, probably a bit of a mixed bag uh, for CTAs. My own trend barometer uh, finished yesterday at 41. That's pretty neutral, but again, it's not. Uh, it's using shorter term uh, look back period, so uh, it's not really to be compared specifically with trend following. Breaking down the numbers, again, these are as of Wednesday evening, Thursday, me yesterday was a positive day in my um, expectation. But as of Wednesday, beta 50 up 2.92% for the month, up 8.38% for the year. SOCGEN CTA index up 3.2%, up 9.35% for the year. SOCGEN trend index up 3.89% for the month, up 11.91% for the year. And the short-term traders index up 0.63% and up 1.2% for the year. Looking at traditional markets, MSCI World uh, up 2.98 for the month, up 8.44 for the year. And the World Government Bond Index uh, up 66 basis points in March, but still down 63 basis points so far this year. And the S&P 500 up 3.22% uh, for the month of March and up 10.56% so far uh, in 2024. All right. I mean, if you have any thoughts, comments uh, on trend following performance, Mark, feel free to jump in before we uh, dive into your topics. No, I think that we'll, uh, we could dive right in because I will sort of say that there there is a big difference, and I'll start with this. Is and this I will frame our initial discussion. Is is that that I use often as a nice benchmark is that the, uh, the Credit Suisse Managed Futures Index. It was okay, a pure can trend you explain following. that? I don't know it actually. Do you know anything about how it, yep. what it's comprised of? Yeah. No, I've worked with uh, with the people out there. So so it's a limited number of markets. They only trade you know seventeen to twenty markets. So so it's so it's concentrated markets they want to start to stay the most liquid then they look at trends at different time frames so that they could scale in and out over a, a large set of time frames and so so it's a so it's focused on 
most liquid markets across a broad universe of assets, which includes the grains, the energies, you know, uh, bonds, et cetera. It uh, looks at multiple time frames, so it has both short-term, medium, and long-term, so they sort of scale in and out. So it's a pure trend-following index. It's not an index of managers, mm-hmm. uh, so you don't have the pollution between trend and, and managed futures. And they're actually using it as a uh, mechanism for you could either buy it in a swap form or you can buy it as a, as a mutual fund product. So, so it is out there and it's available as a, as a trend only. So, so it is a, a, a nice index, not as popular as, uh, we'll, we'll sort of say, the uh, SOC Gen index, the uh, CTA index we use. But it's out there and it's tradable. You can be able to get it every day. So uh, even though Credit Suisse... We we don't know where Credit Suisse is. The, is it these should be days. renamed, shouldn't it? UBS yeah. maybe. Managed yeah. Futures. So yeah. it's it's going to be uh, re, uh, renamed. But uh, I think it's it's a, it's a nice easy benchmark to uh, to follow. But the key is 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 that it only has a limited number of markets. Okay. And so uh, when we look at the performance of a lot of CTAs relative to this benchmark, and I will sort of say that for example, Morningstar uses the uh, Credit Suisse Managed Futures as their benchmark index for all of the Managed Futures products that they look at. It doesn't include cocoa. It doesn't include a lot of the alternative markets, the smaller markets. So that gets to the heart of the issue, which we're probably going to talk about now is the cocoa market. And should you trade more markets or less markets? How should you size those positions? Which has been probably our ongoing discussion for for now years. <laughs> it has, it has. It's such a fun uh, topic to uh, and an important topic to to discuss, and and I still come across it in my uh, client and prospect conversations um, because clearly they are influenced by whatever manager they meet. If they meet someone who trades 300, 400 markets, they're going to be influenced by that. If they meet me or someone else who trades fewer markets, they're going to be influenced by that. So tell me where we are going to go with our cocoa market first topic uh, conversation here. Well, th- the reason why I want to talk about cocoa is because uh, it, it's sort of like a, a combination of everything people talk about for managed futures as uh, both, you know, how you b- develop uh, signals, how you add markets, how you uh, take profits, all of this is tied up in the cocoa market. And so so everyone is going to look to this as, as either the poster child for why you should trade more markets, the poster child for why you should, you know, hold trends longer than uh, as, as long as possible. So let's just go through this a little bit because I think that uh, here, uh, Listeners will find it interesting. So, so first, let's talk a little bit about the cocoa market in general, because you see a price that goes, uh, you know, up to what two hundred and fifty percent in the last year, sixty five percent in a month. Then uh, the first word that everyone that comes to people's mind, oh, it's a bubble. This must be irrational. So. So let's talk a little bit about the cocoa market itself, and then we can sort of say, is this rational or irrational? Because uh, that's fundamental to how trend followers think and why they make money. Is sometimes just because you see a market have a 200% increase, well, that could be irrational, but there also could be reasons for why that might occur in a cocoa market where it won't happen in an individual stock. So first you have to think about, is it cocoa is something that's consumed, okay? It's not a financial asset, it's a, it's a, it's a commodity, which, and what we've seen is, is that there's been supply and demand imbalances for the last few years where there's been excess demand relative to supply. So it's not a, it's not a, a thing that just came up this year. It's been around for a while. Now, what we find out is, is, is that uh, a lot of the cocoa is produced in a, in a limited set of countries, Ghana, Ivory Coast. Those have cocoa boards by the government. So they buy from the farmers. And then what they do is they sort of aggregate all of the the cocoa they have and then sell it out to uh, to the uh, processors later on so to turn into uh, cocoa b- butter and and powder. Surprisingly, the farmers, even though they they sell to a cocoa board from their government, the farmers get very little. So so their price that they're having is probably 
you know, between uh, 10 and 20% of the price that you see, you know, in the marketplace. So if the farmers are getting very little, they have no real incentive to invest in new cocoa plants. And it usually takes about five years from the time you plant a uh, plant and you actually get cocoa pods. So it's different is, uh, than, than what you think for grains or other markets, because you can't just sort of say like, uh, like if you have a factory, say, well, let's put on a third shift on the factory. Well, let's, let's, let's build another factory or let's, 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 you know, sort of, let's say you run the factory all night long. You're, you know, whatever you planted today, you're not going to see any pods for five years. So this problem is not going to go away immediately. So we've had also bad weather. We've had some disease. And then you find out that there are no close substitutes. So, you know, if you, if you like chocolate, you can't get it from somewhere else. So what you have is inelastic demand and supply. So what happens is, is, is that, uh, that, you know, small shocks could cause large price moves. Also, as we'll say, cocoa makes up only a small portion of the price of a chocolate bar. So even, you know, the price could double. But that doesn't mean that uh, that the price of the chocolate bar that you have at the store is going to increase significantly because it's probably the wrapping and the marketing is probably a higher portion of that cost of that bar than the cocoa itself. Yeah, let me just interject actually here for people who may not know this, but it's actually part of this El Nino effect we've seen because that caused a lot of rain happening late last year and that led to some crop damage for sure and then as you rightly said then they had disease uh, which i think is called the black pot disease uh, for this um, so we've had subsequently some extreme heat um, so some of the older cocoa uh, trees um, you know, have had have struggled, and as far as I can tell, and you mentioned that as well, um, because they are not paid very much, the farmers they have not been able to afford things like fertilizer or anything that could kind of mitigate the uh, the reduction they saw in in the crop. So I just wanted to throw that a little bit of background into this. This is unique to commodity markets, and this is is driven all the thinking of trend followers for decades. So if you remember a lot of the early trend followers who were focused almost exclusively on the commodities markets, this is that even though it seems like it's, you know, maybe close to uh, 40 plus years that we've had, you know, um, bond and stock indices, uh, you know, it's still relatively new for uh, f when you think about the trend following over the long run. So that leads to our, our first sort of like big uh, issue that we sort of see on how people create models and what they think about models. And this is something that John Henry always brought up, that trends last longer than expected. So, so constantly, so you want to be in a trend because if you have these commodities that have high supply and demand in, in, in elasticities, then you're going to get trends that could last much longer than expected because you can't find substitutes. So the number one issue is trends will last longer than expected. So always stay in a trend. So that's what we sort of see see happening for a lot of uh, a lot of the market participants. People who are doing well are the ones who are stuck in this trend. And so I did like a, you know just random back of the envelope calculations for cocoa for let's say a twenty day moving average and a hundred day moving average. So twenty day moving average, you probably were you know you could have said I, I, last time you had had a signal that there was the price went through to twenty day was early January. So you'd be in the same trade for this entire uh, period that we've gone up. If you look at a 100-day moving average, you've probably been in that trade for, you know, close to a year, you know, so so you're going back into sometime in 20, uh, 2023. So all the trend followers who are longer-term trend followers have been in this trade for a very long time. They've been able to accrue a lot of profits, and that's been uh, fairly significant. Yeah, I mean, I can confirm that. I mean, we don't use moving averages on our side, but we got long. I don't think I'm sh sharing any too big secrets here, but we got long in January of 2023 uh, thereabouts. Um, and therefore, it's also completely false, of course, when 
some of the media now comes out and say how trend following hedge funds have pushed up the price of cocoa and uh, we're getting in uh, towards the end of 2023 it's completely wrong uh, and right. misplaced yeah right like this has been this almost a perfect trade for a lot of trend followers because it's uh Yes, it has had an explosive increase more recently, but this has been going on for a long time. So people have been in this trade for a fairly long time. Now, is this a bubble? Now, there have been some work out of the, you know, uh, you know, uh, out in uh, Zurich, you know, they, they have uh, some of their centers where they look at uh, a bubble is measured by what we call exponential extremes, and they look at something called the log periodic power law. So the long and short of it is, is, is that if, if a market goes exponential but it's at a certain speed, then they say that there exists a bubble. So, so now right away when you start to say bubble, well, how, what's the likelihood of a reversal? Now, for those who follow this log periodic uh, power law, they would sort of say that as the market becomes more exponential, then it's more highly or more likely that there'll be a reversal, that there's going to be a market reversal. Well, we haven't seen that yet in the cocoa market. Surprisingly, we've seen a lot of volatility, but but again, this would suggest staying as long as possible in the trends. Now, we've had some other work on bubbles recently, and this is from a uh, number of professors at the Harvard Business School and what they wrote a paper called uh, Bubbles for Fama. So, so Eugene Fama said, there's no such thing as bubbles. Everything is rational because markets are efficient. So you can't have ir irrational prices. So what they did is that they looked for large increases in the stock market or stock indices. And then they said, well, what's the probability if you have, let's say, a 100% increase in a certain time frame? that there's going to be a reversal. And what they found is, is that surprisingly, there's a higher probability of a reversal, but it doesn't always, the fact that you have a high price increase doesn't predict that there's going to be a reversal. So again, from a trend follower's perspective, they would sort of say, hold on to trend as long as possible. I can't tell you when the reversal will occur. I know that probability is higher, what if my model is still telling me to stay long? I stay long. Okay. So again, this is sort of suggests that uh, there could be such a thing as a bubble, but you stick with uh, the trades. So given the fact that you have this inelastic demand and supply, and given the fact that you could have these uh, market extremes, what you find is, is that commodity markets especially have fat tails. And fat tails in some so let's think about our normal distribution is there's a greater likelihood you're going to have a big move and at the extremes so and when you think about it that that's what trend followers are trying to partake in they're trying to take advantage of those uh those fat tails so so given these large moves this gets to our next big view this is it trade more markets because you don't know which one of these markets is going to have this big uh shock that would lead to a mark market extreme. Let's go back to our Credit Suisse Managed Futures Index. They said like, well, look, it's important to build an index. We wanna have something that trades only the most liquid markets. It doesn't have cocoa in, in their index. Given it doesn't have cocoa in the index, all the, all the participants who have more of these alternative markets are beating that index handily. So there's, there's a huge gap between the two. And that's because they're trading more markets, which is, you know, sort of the conversation we've been having for a long, long time. Trade more markets because that's what uh, where you're going to get advantage. Well, this is a little bit of a trigger point. I know you didn't know that, but it's a little bit of a trigger point for me when you say that because I've, I've got some interesting observations actually because I think what Coco also does. You're absolutely right. It's a great example for us to focus on because it it's relevant for a lot of the discussions we've had about dynamic position sizing versus static position sizing, trading fewer markets and trading um, hundreds of markets. Okay, so my observation at the moment is that those who trade hundreds of markets, they must have been had cocoa 
but they're not outperforming those who trade fewer markets. When I say fewer markets, I don't mean 10 markets. I don't mean 20 markets. I mean 40 markets upwards, uh, where probably in if you do that, you probably would have Coco in there, right? So if you, it's clearly if you only trade five or 10 markets, there's going to be lots of opportunities you're going to miss, right? Okay, so let's just call it a classical portfolio of CTA type markets that would have included Coco for sure. But that means you may only trade 40, 50, like done 65 markets and not three, 400 markets. Okay, so the first thing I, I notice is that it's the ones who trade the fewer markets that are outperforming the ones who trade a lot of the markets or, or hundreds of markets. I think that's an interesting observation because the argument has been a little bit uh, the other way around. Why could that be? Well, my own guess is that if you trade three, 400 markets, your exposure to any one of those markets, even if you have a 200% move like in Coco, it's not going to make a big difference, frankly. Um, so that's my, I mean, I could be wrong and people can correct me, of course, um, but that's just my observation. It's always been my view that there is a limit to how many markets you really want to trade. And I don't buy into this narrative that trading more markets is better. It's different. It's not better. The second thing um, uh, that I uh, wanted to br bring up is this static versus dynamic position sizing. Because although there is a particular manager out there who did exceptionally well in February from Coco, for sure, my understanding is that that manager actually uses dynamic position sizing. Although I will say, if you can make that amount of money in Coco, that cannot be very dynamic, frankly. But Again, I don't want to sort of get into the details about a single manager, but that's one thing. If I look at it from our perspective, where I sit, um, we do use dynamic position sizing. And, and and this is something that also came up in the conversation um, that Alan and I had uh, in the CTA series that we're going to publish. Actually, a lot of the bigger managers who use dynamic position sizing will have been selling cocoa all this year, <laughs> including where I sit. And so our positions in Coco, us notional positions are so much smaller today than they were at the beginning of the year. Yet still, a lot of these firms are outperforming. So, you know, compared to static managers, I don't, I haven't seen, obviously, uh, from, from that definition, a lot of people say there aren't that many static position sizing managers left. Um, but there are a few we can follow. And I don't see any outperformance uh, from them uh, at the moment either. So, again, these are just observations that I'm making, um, trying to use a live example to frame the conversations we've had for years, uh, where sometimes we kind of need specific real-time examples to discuss. Um, I'm not saying this is conclusive. I'm just saying... It certainly supports my own understanding of these uh, of this discussion, and I firmly believe that um, dynamic position sizing can capture as many outliers as uh, static position sizing. And I firmly believe that you don't have to trade more than, say, 50, 60, 70 markets um, to compete well uh, with those who trade three, 400 markets. Those are my conclusions, and I think... Um, I'm I'm being confirmed in what's going on right now. I know it's a bit controversial, Mark, to bring this up with some of our friends, but but on the other hand, we need to um, do this as and when we see some real examples that we can talk about. Right, you stole my thunder. Oh, shoot. <laughs> sorry. So, well, this is the exact point that we have. Is is that uh, let's let's take a look at some uh, some of the issues. This is that if you dollar weight your positions. The dollar value of your positions, if you know, you know, literally, you know, more than doubled. So, if let's say you had a five percent position in in Coco, then you now have a ten percent position. So, if you sort of say that, well, I want to keep my position size relatively static, you would have had to have been selling into this. Okay, if your volatility weight, okay, and and you could sort of say that you could do a slow adjustment of volatility weight. Volatility has exploded by, you know, a factor over two and a half. So again, you would have cut back your positions on this one. So the only way that, you know, you get the full extent of this is, is that if you sort of say, I uh, 
minimize my dollar weighting adjustments or my volatility weighting adjustments. But then let's look at what the size size issue is. If let's say that you have 100 markets and each one of your positions is a 1% market, market goes up 100%, that adds 1% excess return, let's say if everything else was flat. So we're doing back of the envelope. So, uh, uh, but it's it's just good for the discussion purposes. So if you trade more markets and you can point to one of these markets like Coco and say like, well, look, it's up 100%. That's why trends last longer than expected. You could have these fat tail events. You could have these big moves. In reality, is this is that if you over diversify, then you could have a situation that the impact on performance is going to be minimized. So there's more to picking the sizes of markets than just saying is that I'm going to just stay with the most liquid or I'm going to try to maximize diversification. That this is a really big decision choice that managers make and it has an impact on performance. And you can't extrapolate from a single market to say this is how you should behave or this tells me that this is the test case for why I should do this. In some sense, going back to Daniel Kahneman, uh, there's always a bias that was called the law of small numbers. Is that I come up with one example and then I use that to extrapolate on how I should then apply this to in all cases. So I'm not sort of saying that those people that trade a lot of markets are wrong because they say that that works for them in terms of how they want to diversify, look at the opportunities. But you can't extrapolate from the cocoa market and say, this is the reason for why I should do something a certain way because it just is one representative market and in an extreme relative to all others. And I, I just want to add one thing. Uh, and again, there's absolutely no uh, nothing uh, wrong with doing one or the other. I've, I've always just taken the opposite side because I felt that there was a narrative saying that it is wrong not to do so and so. And and I think that 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 is what I'm opposed to. Um, I think both ways or all ways to do these things, if it works for, for the manager, it, it works, that's fine. Um, but I just want to mention one thing. If your position sizing only happens at the point of entry, which is the kind of definition of the old style type trend following uh, or, uh, or original style uh, trend following, you, of course, would have a great ride. And and this may explain, um, you know, some of the large performance numbers I, I mentioned in, in from February. And that's great, of course. That's wonderful. However... Uh, if you have not changed your notional exposure and you see this price move and the increase in volatility, what it will do, it will have made you a lot of money. So that's good. But what it also will do if you have kept the same number of contracts is it will now dominate the daily swings or the monthly swings of your portfolio because it's going to be such a big, quote unquote, risk allocated to that one position so that's just what it comes with i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just saying that's that's the price you pay for having had such a run uh in in a market like that yeah there's a we'll say risk and reward or two-edged uh two-sided coin this is it you're going to love it on the way up and it's going to have an impact on the way down and another way to look at this is is that again this this the cocoa market embodies everything we talk about trend following everything we talk about risk management now you have a large gap between, you know, the price and where let's, and I'm using the simplest case, the moving average. So you have a large gap between that two. So if you say, I don't use stops, well, then you're going to have to say, we're going to have to have a large give back or uh, you, you better but hope even to if God. you use stops, I think, I think most people who, who do classic trend following, they certainly use stops. That's for sure. So I, I wouldn't re- rule that out, but you're right. It depends on how, how dynamic is your stop algorithm. And actually some sub algorithms, of course, do use volatility to be calculated. So it's not like volatility is not part of it. It's just used in a different way than maybe we would use it, uh, so to speak. Let's leave Coco uh, for now. And by the way, if people think Coco is volatile, I couldn't help notice that yesterday, in one day, Spanish electricity went up by 513% in one day. So although it's still down 94% for the for the last 12 months, it's just to show you that uh, these markets are wonderful uh, in giving us uh, and in humbling us, I'm sure, in terms of what they can do. We 
have so many topics uh, on your list, Mark. So I think I'm going to let you pick from them because we're probably not going to go through all of them in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so what, I'm going to let you drive today completely. So the one that I wanted to bring up and uh, one that I've been looking at is, is that uh, uh, the new, it's it's came out last year, but there's been more talk about the financial conditions index from the Fed. So, you know, for those who follow, you know, the macro side pretty closely, there's financial con- conditions index from Bloomberg, from Goldman Sachs. We have uh, stress indices from the Fed. Now, they, they came up with a financial conditions index. And part of those is, is to, to sort of tell us, by let's look at a number of different market characteristics to try to say, is the monetary conditions, in this case, financial conditions or credit conditions, are they loose or tight? Okay. And what we'll sort of say that if, let's say that uh, credit conditions or financial conditions are tight, that that would suggest that the Fed should, you know, loosen. And if they're uh, loose, then they could just say that they should tight. Why is this important for trend followers and for those who, you know, are more macro focused? Well, the transition between loose and tight could tell us something about what's going on in terms of financial markets. You know, what will happen to the bond market or stock market is is that we'd expect that uh, if we have loose financial conditions, that the stock market should go higher. If it's tighter conditions, it should go lower. So, Interesting. This is is that right now is this is that the uh, we had tight con- conditions in 2022 or 2023. It's now mo- moving to fairly loose conditions. So it actually suggests is that that there's no reason for the Fed to actually lower rates when you think about financial stability, because the conditions index is telling us eh, conditions are are actually f- fairly loose. It's not a very tight uh, tight market. So we've been having all of the discussion about forward guidance, and we listen to, uh, to what Chairman Powell has to say. But as a systematic investor, what you want to look at is you want to look at indicators that'll tell us what are actually happening by Fed policy, not words. This would tell us is that there's probably uh, more of a uh, looser conditions it would suggest that there's no real reason for the Fed to have to lower rates. Interesting is is that uh, that this index is made up of seven uh, financial variables. Everything except, well, you know, is is a tradable uh, market except for the Zillow housing market. So most of it is looking at the stock market, you know, bond markets, let's say Fed funds rate, triple B uh, markets, so, so what you think about it is, is that a financial conditions index is structured by the Fed is actually a trend index. It's a trend index of financial markets. But I think the good thing or the thing that I look at is to say, are there other exogenous factors or are there ways to which we can look at data that can give me an indication of whether what credit conditions would look like? And if the conditions are now loose, then that would suggest that there's a lot of markets, speculative markets could go higher, given the fact that we're not in a tight situation and we're not, it seem like we're in a transition. The transition is going from uh, tight to loose as opposed to loose to tight. And, and that ties to the other issue, because when we think about 2024, as we go into the next quarter, is this that could the market conditions that we see continue. So I think that a lot of people have made money from stock market conditions is, is that we expect also that, you know, bonds are, albeit we probably don't think that rates are going as low as what we expected three months ago, but there's still the case that we're probably going to see the Fed easing, you know, later in the year. So another way in which I look at is, is that what is sitting on the sidelines because that'll tell us what are going to be the new uh, potential buyers of speculative markets or risky assets. And so if you look at money market funds, they're well over uh, $6 trillion in in the United States. Same as in, in Europe, there's a tremendous amount of money that's sitting on the sidelines. Part of it is because rates have been you know, high, so you can make money on cash. If rates start to come lower or start to go lower, and let's say that these trends continue, 
more of that money will start to move out in, into speculative markets, into uh, risky assets. And so that's going to be the fuel that could lead to more trends. Now, we'll sort of say that when we think about a as a trend follower, we expect that there's usually that there's going to be trends take time to evolve. And if let's say we start to see money market funds go down, then again, we're going to sort of see more more money move into risky assets, which could lead to to further trends. The other thing I think about when I listen to you there and talk about these type of uh, indicators is, of course, that there are a little bit of a movement, I guess, in, in our industry for managers who have started looking at and incorporating alternative market data uh, instead of just looking at price. And uh, some so far have had great success with it. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's something that we probably will maybe see more of, uh, I would suspect. There's there's no question. This is that uh, I was in New York uh, earlier in the week, and uh, the two major themes, and this is we not on my list, but the, the two major things that if you talk to any quants and, and, and it was sort of say outside of the systematic trend following bu uh, bubble, because you want to sort of say, what, what are all quants doing? Is number one is, is, is that AI, <laughs> it says so people are going AI crazy and we'll call it, uh, especially at like processing and text data, which is the number one issue that people are looking at. They said, how can I take text? And then turn that into signals, and that could be anywhere from, uh, you know, financial statements, earnings announcement releases, in terms of text of what they say into the, their earnings calls. But we'll probably sort of say that uh, uh, that is the number one issue that people are focused on. It's not as much an issue for trend followers because we're sort of saying that price is still the driver. But we'll sort of say in in more traditional quant area th th that. That part of AI is is where the explosive research agenda is. The second is is the alternative data, and again, is is that uh, uh, this is especially true in the equity markets. It is not as true in probably the trend following area and and managed futures because again, this is is that there is alternative data to collect, but a lot of it is is market specific not of a lot of it is as general now the things that i do look at is, is for example is is that and i think that there is a focus is is that uh data that can tell me about something about what is the market regime that we're in so another thing that i've been working on is to create it uh similar to what state street bank is uh, built is is that they have a risk on euphoria index and what they focus in on this is the stock index volatility, currency volatility, and credit spreads. And we look at those as a combination to tell us whether we should be in a risk on or risk off environment. And if you notice it, it which is very interesting is, is, is that uh, stock uh, index volatility is still extremely low, even though we've had this, you know, fairly good move for the first quarter and, 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 2024, we had a nice 2023, especially in you know in the in the last quarter. And surprisingly, this volatility is extremely low, so it's mid-teens. So so given that, that tells us is that there's less likely that there is going to be a reversal in stock prices if we don't have volatility going up. Now a lot of this has to do with uh, a tremendous amount of. Uh, of vol sellers in the marketplace. So a lot of people are doing option overriding strategies and they're sort of selling options to be able to pick up premium. But we'll sort of say that there hasn't been a lot of a volatility in the marketplace and that's also in the currency markets right now. So, so, and we see that credit spreads are extremely tight. So it tells us that we're in a euphoric environment right now we should suggest that the, that the current environment of stocks going higher is is going to continue. You know, one thing just to circle back uh, and, and something you mentioned earlier a few minutes ago about sort of the uh, AI discussion, and, and I, I see, I meet that as well. But I just want to mention that in a few weeks, we're going to publish a, a, an episode uh, that we recorded last night, uh, Kevin Coldine and I, uh, with the chief global equity strategist and head of market uh, and macro research uh, in Europe, 
Peter Oppenheimer at Goldman Sachs because he just wrote a book uh, that has come out. And what was really fascinating, and I don't want to spoil the thunder here, but what's really fascinating is his view on AI and the other big force that we're seeing at the moment, which is decarbonization, because they're not actually um, that compatible. Uh, so anyways, I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to alert people to keep an eye on, on that episode coming out in the Ideas Lab series in, the, in a couple of weeks. Uh, fascinating insight um, and, and somewhat relevant to to our conversation today here, uh, Mark. All right, well, we've got 10 minutes left, so we still have a few things to pick from, uh, Mark, because your list was <laughs> so just, long. <laughs> as usual, we, we scratched the surface. This is that where did we start with? We started our conversation. We talked about the fact that we've had, you know, a good five-year run for for systematic managers, for, uh, for or C, CTAs. Uh, we've talked about that this is uh, more that the story has gone beyond sort of crisis alpha. We've talked about this probably positive convexity. And then another way to sort of frame this issue is, is that what makes us unique? What makes, you know, what, when you do trend following unique in a macro space, because in some sense, if you're talking about positive convexity and you're investing in, in across asset classes, it's still a macro environment. And what you find out is this is that the uh, uh, trend following does uh, have different behavior relative to macro variables okay uh, that is different than other hedge funds and one in particular is is that we'll sort of say that we've seen that a lot of people said you know you should blend uh, carry with trends or you should blend value with trends and there have been books written about how this is you should be a value investor with trend following. And so what a lot of rich researchers have found is that the sensitivity of trend following is very different to macro risks or macro factors relative to value. So for example, value is very sensitive, has a positive relationship with term premium, okay? Uh, that's just the opposite with trend, uh, trend followers or momentum strategies. So momentum strategies are positively related to uh, industrial production, uh, inflation, unexpected inflation, uh, where you find that the value has just the opposite effect. So on those sort of f macro factor uh, loadings. So there is macro rationale is, is that what you know trend following is trying to pick up is very different than what a, va uh, a value strategy is going to uh, going to be. So. I think that this is what I think investors are starting to pick up is, is that it's not only is the strategy underlying different, but then its sensitivity to different uh, exogenous factors, macro risks is very different. So, so I, th and I think that that's, makes it a unique care, uh, give it unique return characteristics on why you should have it in a portfolio. So there was an interesting set of research where they said like, well, let's try to come up with some macro mimicking portfolios. So let's take all the different, you know, uh, possible alternative risk premiums and let's build, you know, sort of mimicking portfolios for growth, mimicking portfolios for inflation or, you know, defensive portfolios. Now, surprisingly, is is it, and I'm, you know, I'm using interchangeably the word momentum. What they find out is is that for for growth, for defensive, or for inflation, is that having trend following or a momentum strategy is important. It may, it may differ between the asset classes you use because they break it down by asset class. Uh, so that would be momentum for currency or fixed income or commodities. But generally, is this is that it. In all of these different macro mimicking portfolios, it's good to have some type of momentum trend type of component because that's going to give you sort of like a, the ability to uh, take advantage of, of large market moves, which is an important characteristic. Yeah. Uh, so just for, for people to, um, to know... Um, I think what you're referring to is a paper that's called A Century of Macro Factor Investing, Diversified Multi-Asset Multi-Factor Strategies Through the Cycles. Is yes. The one? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a mouthful. but uh, It is a mouthful, actually. I managed, surprisingly, I managed to get through that uh, without... 
<laughs> is it? Yeah. So, so, and I, and I think that this is really important to, uh, to say when you take a step back is this, is that, you know, we often think in terms of what's going on at, at systematic trend following, you know, macro investing, but you have to, uh, but the investor is looking at this in the context of all the other alternative risk premium strategies. And so now what happens is, is that uh, there is a, there's, from a sales cycle or from a sales perspective, there's two parts. This is that does trend following do absolutely on a uh, on an absolute level positive? We've seen that the last couple of five for last five years. So, but then you also want to say what's the relative story? And the relative story is is that this has as unique characteristics versus uh, other hedge fund styles. Speaking of hedge fund styles, Mark, I uh, don't know if I interrupted you there. No, no, but there was, there was a poll, so I jumped in. Yes. Um, there was one point that you actually mentioned, and I don't know if that might be the last topic or the second last topic we're going to talk about, where you were looking at a paper, um, global macro versus trend following. Although, from memory, I didn't necessarily completely agree with all the conclusions, but do you want to say a few words about that um, paper. And I'll, by the way, I'll link to these papers, but I will not do it on my website. I will do it if you have your, uh, if you listen to this podcast on your mobile phone and you go to one of the apps uh, like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, in the show notes of the episodes, there, there should be a, a link popping up to these uh, papers, by the way, but that's just the easiest way, uh, way for me to to share them. Right. Well, you're not going to compare managed futures or trend following versus long short equity. You know the the compared uh, comparison you're going to make in terms of if you're looking to fill your uh, bucket of alternative risk premiums is is more global macro. You could sort of say that systematic trend following and managed futures is a subset of global macro. So we could get a huge discussion about whether that's true or not. I'm sure but, we can. But uh, so so what this researcher did is said like well let's look at the HFR uh, index we can look at global macro indices and we can look at trend following indice, uh, indices and let's compare the two and so it it shows us is that uh, that you get different return characteristics and downside protection from each one of these now what they did is is to say like well let's see let's see if there what are the factors that can be able to drive alpha in global macro and managed futures and so what they did is they looked at a number of uh, of of we'll call it factors that could uh, drive alpha you no know, different than you know like your beta and they looked at uh, you know momentum uh, characteristics. After you take out all the momentum characteristics, you don't have a lot of alpha for for trend following not surprising that's what we actually do so but you have a lot of uh sort of alpha for global macro so with the so one way to view this is one global macro is different than trend following okay uh after you take out all of these other factors you have sort of negative alpha for trend following you still have positive alpha for global global macro it doesn't seem that surprising because if let's say if a trend follow or if you sort of look at uh, trend following factors and you take those out or try to explain trend followers by that, lo and behold, you're going to take out a lot of the alpha. What it does tell is global macro is different, but we also find this is that when we put it into portfolios, this is that you could sort of say that it, depending on what you want from your uh, alternative investment, you're going to get a different result. So if you want to have a little bit of extra return, you know, you may want to put in global macro in your portfolio. If you're worried about downside risk, you know, over a long period of time, you want to put more trend following in. So there's a place for both of them, even though this uh, this author would probably argue that global macro is, uh, is better. I would argue is, is, is that, uh, that it depends on what you want to do with it. And Again, it probably sort of goes out, to, uh, goes back to the key point, which we often talk about is this: is that if you if you add a more con uh, convexity, which you get from trend following, then you're going to get some more downside protection. If you want more absolute return, which is probably more standalone return, you get less convexity than you want global macro, 
And so depending on what you want, it'll, it'll make it uh, have an impact on which, which one you choose of those two. Yeah. And, 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 and just jumping in here, I would say I don't even agree with necessarily the global micro gives you better returns in the long run. I actually don't, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think trend followers will give them a run for their money. That's for sure. Um, but I said, this might be the last topic. And then I looked at your list of topics and I thought there's one more that I really think would be interesting because we have a lot of actual investors following the podcast, uh, both institutional investors, individual investors, but also a lot of private uh, family offices. Um, and you actually have a little bit of a, a, a point that I also uh, heard in this conversation that I recorded with Alan uh, in terms of sort of shifts or trends not trends that we follow, but trends happening in our industry at the moment that pertains to family offices, um, some of the investments they hold, and, and maybe the shift that they see right now between different kinds of investments. If, I don't want to steal your thunder here, but I, I think you know what I'm talking about. If you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about that before we wrap up. Well, a lot of the large consulting firms have actually done surveys of family offices to try to, and pension funds to find out what's your asset allocation. And so, and what the argument has been, or what they've shown with the, some some recent uh, data, is that family offices have much larger alternative allocations. Alternative, uh, you know, uh, they have a more percentage of their portfolio in alternatives. Than traditional pension funds, they're still driven by, you know, you know, stocks and bonds. And so they said, like, well, this is uh, shows, in some sense, you know, that they're more progressive. The family office has been more cutting edge. They've been able to diversify better. And so, but what we do find is, is, is that that a lot of that alternative exposure has been into private uh, private equity, and we'll sort of say that the private equity market is. Uh, uh, at the extreme, well, sort of like a Cliff Asnes would say that private equity is a volatility smoothing because they don't get priced as often that that they can have a, a much smoother return pattern. <laughs> but in reality, is is that that may be an illusion. So, for example, in 2022, stock market was down. You know, we'll say that uh, private equity say they put their marks at the end of the year is almost uh, flat. So. They're all uh, they're up uh, a little bit more in 2023. So so what we find out is, is is that a lot of people invested in private equity. Now they're finding out because it's harder to get out. There's a liquidity issue. So what I would probably sort of say, and it's a theme that we could return to, is that from within the alternative space, that we're going to see a lot more rotation. And the rotation that we're going to see is for away from private equity. Mm. Okay. Which has done very very well, but if let's say that we have let's say a, a a change in the economic environment and let's say stocks start to uh, uh, reverse, is that the private equities are not going to be able to sell? So you're going to be in a liquid investment, so that you'll say, well, gee, I want to have more liquidity in my portfolio. Okay, and if let's say uh, returns in private equity have been compressed or starting to be compressed. So that then the gap between private equity relative to managed futures or other alternatives has has been closed. Then you could sort of say that the value of liquidity, or you know, uh, or the premium you receive for illiquidity, will not be as high. So that you might start to choose liquid alternatives to be able to diversify your portfolio. Yeah, no, absolutely perfectly said, um, because that's exactly one of the topics um, that uh, Alan and I was discussing with our uh, most recent guest, uh, which also comes out uh, in, uh, in a short uh, space of time. This was absolutely perfect. Uh, Mark, I really do appreciate you and uh, doing all the preparation for this conversation and uh, doing it on a Easter Friday at a very, very early time uh, where you are. So I hope that people will um, go and share this uh, episode and also, um, uh, you know, hit follow or subscribe or whatever it's called nowadays um, in appreciation for all the uh, hard work that uh, uh, Mark has put into uh, this uh, episode uh, today. Next week, we are joined by Andrew. 
And this will be an interesting conversation because he doesn't trade cocoa. So let's see how, what he's been up to uh, and how he's found ways to uh, actually do pretty well, uh, as far as I can tell, so far this year. And if you have some questions for Andrew, please make them very tough and send them to info at toptradersonplug.com because he uh, he's very good at dealing with tough questions. Um, and, uh, of course, you should also go to the Top Traders Unplugged website where you can follow um, the daily uh, trend barometer uh, and the daily market score. Uh, lots of other resources, and I will be publishing some new ones, some new books, actually, fairly soon. Uh, and for those who uh, uh, can't get enough of good investment books, there will be a new updated Ultimate Guide 2024 edition where we've added more than 100 new books. Uh, so we're at... at, at past 400 books in the next edition and i hope to bring that out uh, very soon as well so keep an eye out for that if you already subscribe to it um to the previous edition i'll make sure you get a copy of the new one but anyone who uh, subscribed now to the ultimate guide from the website will also be updated uh, with a new one when it comes out very shortly uh, and of course um, there is the uh, monthly trend following update uh, from rich and me always uh, exciting and colorful and um, the latest one is also to be found under the resource uh, sorry in the blog post section from mark and me thank you ever so much for listening we look forward to being back with you next week until then happy easter and take care of yourself and take care of each other thanks for listening to top traders unplugged if you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.